All right, everybody, welcome to um, <laughs> the second of our wonderful sessions with um, Professor Nora Gilbert, um, who is our Dickens Project Friends Faculty Fellow this year. Nora, um, as as many of you remember, um, was here with us last month. Is that a month ago? A month ago. Time yeah. is broken. <laughs> um, talking to us about the um, the new project she's working on, an edited volume um, called Victorian Gaslighting. And so she told us all about that project and the history of um, the history of the term gaslighting and the kinds of essays that are going to be part of that project. And today she is here to lead us in a conversation about the 1944 movie Gaslight, which um, which hopefully everybody had a chance to watch. Um, I watched it for the first time on Friday and was just completely floored by it. Um, so I'm really excited to welcome Nora back and to thank her for being here and excited to welcome all of you back for this chat about this completely lunatic movie. Um, so now just turn things over to Nora to get things started. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Renee, for having me do this whole thing. And thank you, Courtney, so much for all the organizational stuff and John for organizing all the Dickens project in general. And um, I I hope you'll bear with me that I'm going to talk at you a little bit more at the beginning of this. And then I swear I'm really in it for the conversation that we're going to have. I'm really looking forward to that. But if you remember, and maybe a few of you weren't here last month, I don't know. Um, but I'll just rehash a little about what I was saying there. And what I couldn't say last time is I, I didn't want to get into any of the actual plot differences between the four different um, major adaptations of Gaslight that came out in the 1930s and 40s because I didn't want to do any plot spoilers, right? So this time I'm just going to highlight for you. So you've watched the 1944 one, but remember there were three others that came before that. And I'll just... Um, reiterate that the 1938 play by Patrick Hamilton um, first premiered on the London stage in December of 1938, and then it had like about a six month run um, on the West End in London. And then in 1940, about a year later, they, they um, released a British film version called Gaslight. Um, and then right after that, in the United States, there was a Los Angeles version that was really briefly lived, but then Vincent Price saw that and then he was like, oh, I need to do this on Broadway. So they had a, a version that was called Angel Street that ran on Broadway for four years, which is an incredibly long time for a non-musical to run. It's one of the longest running non-musicals on broad in Broadway history. And so it was a huge, huge success. And then in 1942, um, MGM decided they wanted to do a Hollywood version because it was so successful. And so remember I was telling you how I went to the archives, the MGM archives, and I found this document that was clearly written by somebody who was tasked with comparing the first three versions to say how their plots differed uh, so that they could decide what they wanted to do. And the thing that's so interesting about it, I can now tell you is that um, in this document, it says that the the end of the, the 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 third act of the original Broadway, no, not Broadway, London version. In that act, it, the the third act belongs to Bella is the way that it puts it, as opposed to in all the other versions where the third act belongs to Ruff, which is the name of the detective. It gets changed to Brian Cameron in the movie you watched. But so the detective comes in. So the way it describes how the differences are at the end is that. In the original play, um, Bella is the name of the character, the, the woman, now she's changed to Paula in the version you saw, but Bella is the one who tells her husband of a dream she has had in which she saw the brutal murder of Alice Barlow. That's the name of the woman who gets murdered in that version. She accuses her husband. Ruff enters at this point to arrest him and to hand him over to the waiting police. In both Angel Street, the Broadway version and the British film version, by contrast, according to this document, the climax belongs to Ruff, the hero detective. It is Ruff who comes out to rescue Bella from physical violence at the hands of Manningham. Ruff exposes Manningham as the murder of Alice Barlow. More specifically, the document describes the point at which the power balance shifts away from Bella and toward Ruff in the later two versions. Quote, in the movie, Bella begins to tell her husband of a dream she has had. Ruff steps out and says precisely what he says in Angel Street. Was I a part of that curious dream? But here's the issue. This is just what happens in the purportedly original or first edition copies of Gaslight, the Patrick Hamilton play, that my co-editors and I have been able to track down so far. In each of them, it's Ruff who steps out to say, was I any part of this curious dream of yours, Mrs. Manningham, which is similar to what you saw in the uh, MGM film. It's Ruff who recounts the brutal murder of Alice Barlow. It's Ruff who accuses Manningham of being the killer. So if this MGM document is to believe, be believed, and I don't think there's any reason why it wouldn't be, the original version of Gaslight from 1938 
granted significantly more agency and fortitude to its gaslit heroine than do any of the versions to which we now have access. Now, this is not to say that the accessible versions are entirely devoid of female agency and fortitude, of course. All of them do, for instance, contain that powerful scene near the end in which Bella or Paula has a moment alone and she says, if I were not mad, I could have helped you, but because I am mad, I hate you, because I am mad, I have betrayed you, and because I am mad, I am rejoicing in my heart without a shred of pity, without a shred of regret, watching you go with glory in my heart. Those are, that's in all the different versions of Gaslight that we can see or read today. But there is another part of the Gaslight plot that also emphasizes the strength and resilience of its Gaslit heroine to a degree that often goes unacknowledged and or misrepresented. And this is where I just want to get a little uh, up on my textual accuracy high course, if you'll uh, bear with me for a moment. A case in point of this can be seen and it can see, be seen in anything. Anytime you read an article about gaslighting in the New Yorker, in the New York Times, anything on Wikipedia, they all say this plot point slightly incorrectly, but I'm maybe most offended by the fact that in the recent book on gaslighting by Kate Abramson that just came out, and she's like the expert on gaslighting, and she starts it off by saying you have to understand uh, the movie version Gaslight to understand this term, and this is how she describes um, how the husband goes about driving his wife insane. She says, the title of the movie is drawn from the following manipulative move. Gregory regularly searches for Paula's jewels in the attic, and when he does so, his turning on the lights there has the effect of dimming the gas lights elsewhere in the house. Every time this happens, Paula asks him why the gas lights have dimmed, and every time Gregory denies that any such thing has happened, insists Paula is imagining things, and suggests that this, is, this too is a sign of her growing mental illness. While Abramson is correct in her description of the lights dimming in the lower part of the house when Gregory turns them on in the attic, the rest of what she details simply does not take place in the MGM film or in any other stage or screen version of Gaslight. Paula slash Bella never once asks Gregory slash Paul slash Jack why the gas lights have dimmed or even lets on to him that she has noticed their dimming, which means that he never once denies that any such thing has happened and so forth. In the MGM film, you might remember, Paula only discusses the dimming of the lights with her two housemaids, Nancy and Elizabeth, to ask whether they have turned the lights up in another room to cause the dimming to happen, and with Brian Cameron, who witnesses the dimming himself and is able to corroborate what she has been experiencing. You saw that too? Oh, then it really happens. I thought I had imagined it, she sighs in relief. In Gaslight and Angel Street, the two play versions, Sergeant Ruff doesn't play a corroborative role so much as an appreciative one. When Bella shares with him her observation that the gas lights always go down after her husband leaves and come back up shortly before he arrives home, making her suspect that somehow he had come back and it was he who was walking about up there, Ruff fully acknowledges the role that her skills of discernment are playing in solving the mystery and catching a murderer. He says, you know, Mrs. Manningham, you should have been a policeman. She says, are you laughing at me? Do you think I am? Do you think I imagine everything too? And he says, oh no, I was merely praising the keenness of your observation. I not only think you are right in your suppositions, I think you have made a very remarkable discovery and one which may have very far reaching consequences. Instead of serving as yet another example of scheming manipulation on the husband's part then, the dimming of the titular gaslights in fact represents a way out of the gaslighting abyss for the wife who, in spite of all her husband's efforts to blur and blight her sense of her surroundings, is sharp-witted and sharp-sighted enough to realize it's happening. Viewed from this angle, it's a bit more, it's a bit ironic that gaslighting has come to be the term used to describe the kind of psychological manipulation depicted in the narrative. It would perhaps be more appropriate to say that someone has been broached or pocket watched or little pictured as since those are in fact the objects that Jack slash Paul slash Gregory hides and moves around in order to rattle Bella slash Paula's mind. From another angle though, the term feels just right, encompassing as it does both the threat of uncertainty, self-questioning and self-doubt that can be brought on by the nefarious external forces and the path to resistance and overcoming and escape. And this is what the essays in our Victorian Gaslighting Collection highlight again and again, the relationship between acts of gaslighting and acts of resistance in Victorian literature and culture. So I just wanted to um, make that point. And then again, I'll just say really quickly the, the, the different versions, what's different about this, the uh, Hollywood version you watched. In the original play, it all takes place 
in one 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 evening in order like has that unity of time place action so it just starts it basically starts with the scene where if you remember where gregory is lying there asleep and he and then she wakes him up and he says oh why don't you call nancy to come and put coals on the fire that's the beginning of the play so everything that came before that in this movie is added and they really want to show you the transition from a non gaslit woman to the, the process of gaslighting her in the play you just see it just comes in in media race and you can just see that she's already had this they have to tell the story of how um this happened and then of course the uh, romance is not in the um early version it's kind of an avuncular older man character the sergeant ruff who comes in and of course this being hollywood they're like let's get us some heteronormative romance in there and make her fall in love with somebody new um and then but all the parts where uh, it's set uh, in italy in the beginning and i'm going to one of my questions actually ties into that so i want some more but anyway so i just wanted to give you that backstory and now i'm going to open it up to um questions uh, if anybody wants to ask me anything to start you certainly can i have questions for you but if anybody had questions about what i just said or what i said last week or anything in the movie that was you want to clarify for you or anything i'd be happy to to answer questions to start before I start asking. Does anybody have any questions? All right, well then I will ask you questions and then you'll have to answer me. Okay, so, um, so let's see. My first question that I was going to ask is, Having watched this movie now, and I don't know how many of you have seen it before versus your first time, like Renee just explained to us. Oh wait, do I see a hand go up? Oh, John, I see a hand go up. Do you want to, do you want to ask a question here? Go ahead. I have a, have a question. Um, okay. One is, I, I guess I have two questions. One is about the music, about the music, okay. theme, mm -hmm. both, both the music in the story and the background music to the to the film yeah. that we watched. And so uh -huh. I'm sure that somebody has, has done a lot of work on that. And I don't know enough about music history to be able to suss it out myself, but I'm really yeah. curious to know about music. And the Trilby reference is certainly mm -hmm. is part of the background to that. And then the other question I have is, is uh, about names. And mm -hmm. um, you, you, you've gone through this kind of quickly. And so I haven't I know, I know. cracked yeah. all of the name changes yeah. from the original play to the mm -hmm. film version, and I, I'd like to get those clear, and, yep. and and also to ask about the significance of both the names in the film and then the changes in the names. So yes. those, those oh, are two yeah. questions. Those are two good questions. Thank you for both of them. And last week I had that PowerPoint up, and I had the little um, the the chart with all the different names, and I think it would take too much figuring on the fly for me to call up the actual actual PowerPoint again. But I'll just tell you. So um, the big difference has to do with um, nationality. So in the original play, the names are Jack Manningham. So make it all about man. It's Jack Manningham, and his real name. Name turns out to be Sydney Powers. So that still implies Britishness. There's nothing in the original play that implies that any characters are anything but English characters. And that's kind of what my chapter is about, that they, in the both movie versions, they really change that um, because of the casting. So um, it's Jack Manningham, the wife's name is Bella Manningham, and the detective's name is Sergeant Ruff. And those are the, the, the original names in the, in the play. They Bella Man Bella stays the same in the British movie and Ruff stays the same in the British movie. But the big change is that it's played by the actor Anton Walbrook, who's this Austrian Jewish actor, and they're like with a very heavy Austrian accent. So they make him pointedly a foreigner. And there's that line I think I quoted last time where they say, Oh my goodness, he's a foreigner. I thought he, I heard he was respectable. And like they're they're implying that foreignness means you can't be respectable. But his name becomes Paul Mallon, M-A-L-L-E-N which is kind of like ambiguously foreign, doesn't really get to put, but it's supposed to be a pseudonym, of course, or a made up name. And his real name in the, in the first version is Louis Bauer, B-A-U-E-R, Louis Bauer. And um, it's implied very much that he is a foreigner. They're kind of ambiguous about, uh, unclear about where he's from. In the Hollywood movie that you all watched, the name, there were many changes to the script over the years. I don't have, it's, it went from like Ivan Petrov, that sounds incredibly Russian. And then they had one that was Sergei something. They, they had different names, they, but in one script, they call him Polish explicitly. They say he's Polish. So, the, and even though all along they knew it was Charles Boyer would be the actor, but they never made the character name sound French. 
Um, and so, and then his name that he comes up with, his real name turns out to be Sergius Power in this version. And he's supposed to have been from uh, the name that he, that they met him, she met him in Prague, right? Which is Western Europe, not Eastern Europe. That's I was corrected last time. So anyway, and so that's what, why they changed the names really. And Paula Alquist is her name. Uh, her aunt's name is Alice Alquist. They just take Alice Barlow in the original version. That's very, again, very English. And they make it Alice Alquist, which definitely a Swedish uh, sense because of, Ingrid Bergman being the actress who played her. So those are the names. And now your music question is a great one. And one of the things I'm going to ask you all in a moment is to think about the, the uh, cinematic elements, including things like the sound and the music. So this is the thing I've got for you that's the most interesting that I found is that the music that is playing, that she, the song that um, Paula is singing in that opening scene when she's an opera singer, and that's really Ingrid Bergman's voice, and it's, you know, not that great. She's like, it's, she's trying, but she doesn't sound like a professional. Like the, 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 the music you hear in the opening sequence, I believe, I don't know who it is. I don't think it's credited, but it's an, a professional opera singer. It's supposed to be her aunt, I think, singing. But the song she's singing there is from Bride of Lama Moore. Um, by an Italian opera. Anyone know it? I have it in my uh, article. I could look it up. But the idea is it's from the um, the, the Walter Scott um, Bride of Lemon So it's a, it's a plot about a woman going mad because of a, a kind of forced marital plot on her. So that, I think, was very explicitly picked to be one. And of course, the dialogue in that scene is about how she can't understand the tragedy of this opera. And then he's like, wait a second, what am I talking about? Your aunt was killed. You can't understand tragedy, but you're too in love and you can't be a good opera singer if, you, if you're falling in love with someone. So that I know for sure. And of course, they do mention that it's Strauss played the very famous song, but I think that's the one that kind of has the most um, kind of thematic connotations to it. And um, that answer your question or do you want to hear more about any of that? Oh, you're muted. 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 Yeah. Uh, what, what about the, uh, is, is it Scottish or Irish, the, 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 the melody that is played by the hand organ oh, yeah, that yeah, passes yeah. in the street? What, what, right. is, what is that song and what is its relevance? I don't know. I don't remember off the top of my head. I believe that I was going to see, I should have brought my actual script of the play up because in the, the script in the play, I remember that it starts off with your, you can't see it because it's all, you know, takes place in the drawing room, but it has a stage direction that you can hear the sounds of me and she's commenting like kind of like oh do you hear that that's just the sound of, of London life going by kind of thing I forget if they name it or not if I had my script with me right here but it's downstairs maybe if we maybe I can go grab it at some point or I can just email you and let you know but I don't remember off the top of my head but yes absolutely it's supposed to give that sense of like this is what London life is and these you know especially in the movie versions these foreigners are off playing their Strauss and their Italian opera they're not they're not English as much as the sounds that we hear in the kind of um I want to say compared to like the Miss Thwaite uh, who is the epitome of Britishness right so yeah okay oh uh, let's see I see um Michael raise your hand yeah. um this issue about foreigners I'm Joseph Cotton's accent is clearly American um, I know what what, what to what did they think about that when they were casting him? And how does it reflect on this whole issue about nationality? I'm giving yes. you a trouble. He has a strong accent, but so does Cotton, actually, in the context of Britishness. Absolutely. I will say this. I'm pretty sure that they just figured that people could back that. They did this all the time. If you want to see a movie with amazing bad accents, watch Under Capricorn, a Hitchcock movie that came about, I think it's 1949, stars Ingrid Bergman and Joseph Cotton. They are both supposed to be Irish with their heavy American and heavy Swedish accents. They, and they, they say, we are both from Ireland. We are the most Irish of Irish people. And you're like, no, you're not. They really did not care as much as we do today about people putting on accents. And I, the way I talk about it in my chapter is that he is clearly American. He does not even slightly try to do a British accent, but they point out, he, there's that scene where you see him with his niece and nephew and they're at the Tower of London and they both have heavy British accents and are like, Uncle Brian, what are you doing? And that was a terrible version of one. I don't know why I did that. But um, the idea is they're very British and they imply that he has lived there since he was little because they say that he grew up there and that he saw Alice Alquist in Covent Garden. So they really kind of, and he works at Scotland Yard. So my 
thought is, is that they just thought audiences were too dumb to be able to tell that that wasn't, that he wasn't British. They just didn't care back then as much as we do. And in terms of Paula, she obviously has a Swedish accent. Ingrid Bergman doesn't change her accent, but in the script, there's actually a line where it says, even though she's a cosmopolitan woman and is from different places, when she speaks, it's pure English. So there's supposed to be a difference between her actual you know foreignness and and the character the husbands which is supposed to seem so kind of dire and scary and so yeah it, it's definitely different in the british film version it's absolutely not that he's the only one who has any kind of accent so the character the actors who play the wife the, the detective they're all legitimately english actors so you do have this real sense of the difference between the husband and everybody around him in that movie yeah but good question because joseph Patton ain't doing a british accent that's for sure yeah. All right, John, you're using your hand again? Or is that yes, I, I, ha I have a follow-up question to, to sure. Michael's good question it, because it deals uh, with, with nationality and indirectly, I guess, also with accent um, mm -hmm. and, and with names. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know whether this is a stretch, but there's something Scottish going on with Cameron as the name for the detective and yeah. Scotland Yard and Sir Third. Walter Scott. So that's absolutely true. So there's a sense of, um, you know, that Scottish is somehow slightly different that he counts as, you know, but, but there is this sense that like, he's the recuperative force, right? He's going to bring her back to being with the kind of person she should be. So it's like, can she, and of course, Scotland Yard has Scottishness, but it also has the authority of the law. So the fact that it's like, we're going to get you back in the house. I do love the fact that he, um, he, he strengthened it. Like he's not, and, and I will say Ruff, the character, Sergeant Ruff in the earlier versions is much more kind of abrasive. And like, he's like, I'm going to, I'm going to save the day. I'm going to come in. He kind of comes in and pushes past her and stuff. And he forces her to drink alcohol. He's like, you've been, I should say in the original play, he, he drugs her. He forces her to take, um, uh, drugs for the husband does to make her um, because to calm her down and so forth. So there's a sense that he's drugging her into feeling more, um, you know, dis dissociated and so forth. But then the detective comes in, and he's like, you need some, I believe he might say some scotch whiskey. In fact, I think he says <laughs> like he needs scotch whiskey. So there is uh, a sense that he is he's a British but is he fully English and like there's a sense of bullying and whereas in the the Brian Cameron character they definitely tone down the um like I'm gonna bully you into doing what I want because in, in the first one I believe I read somewhere uh, that somebody saw a version they're like you're not supposed to realize whether the detective is the real bad guy or the husband for a while which that doesn't really play into the later version so in the original the original play apparently the big moment was that the detective is there he has a hat and he leaves it and then he's going to go hide when the husband comes home and he leaves the hat on the stage and apparently audiences lost their mind they were just like the, hat, the hat's there oh no they're like screaming for the audience so this is the most visceral part of the original play is that the, he leaves the hat on the stage but uh, that didn't make it into the film version so yeah so i think scottishness has some has some peripheral uh, importance too yeah and and one small thing in connection with this uh, about rough is rough marked by his accent in the in the in the play version or his it, origin it, or yeah, his plan. It doesn't say it in the original version. And I'm wondering if in the play, I mean in the movie, I believe the actor is from, I should look up where he's from. He does seem to have an accent that I'm not exactly sure. It might be just like it's it's a different uh dialect of English. It might be Yorkshire or something, but he sounds like I, I'm not I, I didn't pay enough attention to that because I'm not really paying attention to the that character as much, but it is um different and it's not and certainly Bella the main lead actress she has a very elegant uh, English accent that doesn't feel like it's at all regionalized um so but I don't think that the play marks him as being like he's a Scottishman or an, an Irishman or something like that I think that it just depended on who played it I know that the, the character the actor who played it in the Broadway version was Leo G Carroll who's in a whole, lot, a whole lot of Hitchcock movies. I think he's just English though. I don't think he's Irish. So that's the kind of thing that you just cast it differently and it has a whole different meaning, right? And now we're suddenly commenting on the difference between Englishness and Irishness or Scottishness or whatever. So yeah, but- Is, um, he, mar is he marked by class? Well, he's a, he's a former detective. So there's this sense of which like he, oh, one thing that he's marked by is, um, uh, flamboyance. He he takes off his shirt. And he's like, I'm wearing a pink ruffly shirt. You weren't expecting that of me. So there are ways that they play with the character, but I don't think that the 
it's mainly like, I mean, the, the idea of him being a working detective makes him more, I will say in the original play, I should mention that they're supposed to be kind of shabbier genteel than in the, a lot of people think that the, especially the American film version made them seem like they had a lot more money than they originally meant for in the play. Cause it kind of describes it as being this, like it's, it's, it is the London town home. That's what it's supposed to be. But there's this the language is marks it as that they are, you know, not particularly wealthy. They're kind of middle class but just barely they you know they have just the two servants and they're, they're not you know what i mean so there is a sense that they're not the ultra privileged people um and in the in the later versions it's where the woman becomes she has the money she has the of course in our version it says she inherited the house from her aunt but in the second the, the british film she says to him at one point well i she says i never felt this way until we got to this house and this was the house that you used my money to buy was that why you married me for my money so she it's very explicit that he's foreign and that he didn't have the money that she had in the again that's the british film version they're all these different iterations of it but yeah so class works differently in different things. All right, I do see another hand. This is Jay Morrow. Hi, thank you. So I was thinking about the American film and this discussion of accents and nationalism. And yeah. I was also on my last rewatch of the film thinking about its place as a 1944 mm -hmm. film. So mm -hmm. if you could, I was wondering if you could say something about it as both a war film and uh -huh. a, I guess the best definition is a proto film noir, because it also made me think a lot about Laura, especially with the portrait of the aunt and the music. Uh -huh. So yep. I was wondering if you could touch on that, please. I can so touch on that because that's one of my questions. So I was going to give you this big quote that is exactly about what you're talking about. So I'm going to cheat and read to you a question that I was going to ask. So I said, since I've gone over some differences between the different stage and screen versions, I wanted to ask how you all felt about what's probably the biggest difference in the version you watched, which is the added backstory of how Gregory and Paula meet in Italy and what she must do to be with him. Specifically, the MGM adaptation turns the gaslight narrative into one about a woman giving up her professional opera singer career aspirations to get married and be a stay-at-home wife and I mean like an ultra stay-at-home wife like who doesn't leave the house ever so this movie really makes the Victorian home feel like a claustrophobic prison a haunted house as Paula specifically calls it so here's where I get to your point the feminist film scholar Tanya Modleski has made the following point about how that element of the plot which spawned a whole new subgenre that she calls gaslight noir uh, may be read in relation to its specific historical moment so this is from Tanya Maleski's book called Loving with a Vengeance uh, from 1982. She says, in the 1940s, a new movie genre derived from Gothic novels appeared around the same time that hard-boiled detective fiction was being transformed by the medium into what movie critics currently call film noir. Not surprisingly, film noir has received much, has received much critical scrutiny both here and abroad while the so-called gaslight genre has been virtually ignored. According to many critics, film noir possesses the greatest sociological importance in addition to its aesthetic importance because it reveals male paranoid fears developed during the war years about the independence of women on the home front. Beginning with Alfred Hitchcock's 1940 movie version of Rebecca and continuing through and beyond George Cukor's Gaslight in 1944, the Gaslight noir films may be seen to reflect women's fears about losing their unprecedented freedoms and being forced back into the homes after the men return from fighting to take over the jobs and assume control of their families. So this relates exactly to what you're talking about, the idea that this is a 1944 movie where people, it was the war is still going on, but people were starting to think about like the, the gender politics ramifications of this war. And so critics like her read it very much through the lens of that time period. And it's really true, this gaslight noir genre, which you're talking about, Laura certainly is, it's film noir, but it also is the female Gothic. So it's kind of the go the gaslight noir genre, I'll just point out, is actually there's a whole bunch of movies made right after Gaslight that are set in the Victorian era or like the Edwardian era, like the early um, 20th century that are all about women losing their minds, women being trapped in homes, women um, 
you know, really being victimized by uh, through um, the kind of manipulations and mental illness that are clearly because Gaslight was so popular. That's why it became this burgeoning subgenre. But it's one that people almost never watch anymore, as opposed to film noir, which they're just you can't find a, a university that doesn't have a class on film noir. I've taught a class on, on sensation fiction and film noir. It's a fascinating genre. But Gaslight Noir really gets short shrift um, in terms of our critical thinking. So um, is that what you had in mind? Or were you thinking also about just kind of the, the nationality stuff too, about the idea that this is, you know, the first film version was made in 1940 when the, the Britain was in the war, but the US was not. But the idea of what are you doing with an Austrian actor in this moment, who's gonna be the bad guy? And like, is it playing into fears of Germany and Austria? Because he worked in German films, right? He was, his name was Adolf before it became it's Anton Wahlberg, the guy who plays the husband in the British film. So it's all related to this um, thorny um, international pol political field. Was that what you had in mind or were you thinking about other things too? I was primarily thinking about Gaslight Noir, the thinking about Gaslight as a film noir kind style yeah. film with yes. the focus on the femininity and also right. female sexuality. Yes, absolutely. And so it's really Gaslight Noir and film noir. I mean, you could say that they're just too... They're all, it's all noir, right? It's all, you could say it just depends on what the influence of uh, the emphasis is. But for sure, the idea that this is a genre that popped up right at this moment, it certainly relates to um, the kinds of psychological anxieties that any massive war with that much death and that much destruction is going to bring about in like, I don't know, like a global population level. But then how are we going to translate that into the kind of stories that we think people want to see and will relate to. And I think that that's, it's no coincidence that both film noir and gaslight noir came about in that historical moment. Yeah. And uh, Michael, did you want to add into that or tell us more? Things, you know, in terms of cinematography, this is certainly a precursor. You know, if you think about the way shadow, darkness, um, sleeping, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the, the camera angle, you know, the, the, the positioning of the camera, I mean, it certainly, pre, you know, kind of foreshadows noir cinematography. I just wanted to, yeah. but, you know, I think, you know, the other echo for me is Casablanca, you know, and, which is also, you know, war film and, and Bergman and, and, and the relationship of Ilsa to her character in this film. Do you talk about that at all in your piece? I don't, but I'd love to. Hear Casablanca right behind me. You see that? I love Casablanca. Uh, this is her next film after Casablanca. Yes, absolutely. And yo, go ahead. What else do you want to say about it? You know, and she wins the Academy Award for this. Uh -huh. You know, it was best, you know, one best film. This was nominated for best film. So, but you know, to me, the, you know, juxtaposing those two characters in the, uh -huh. in the kind of the evolution of heroines, if that's their, you know, in, in 40s film is kind of yeah. interesting. Oh, it's fascinating. I kind of want to write an article at some point. There's an article that was written that's uh, called Jimmy Stewart is being beaten. It's playing off of the Freud thing about a child is being beaten. But it's an article about the fact that when he went off to war and then when he came back, he had all these movies that kind of put his body through the ringer. And like because he's this traumatized war, um, you know, he, he actually was in the war doing this stuff. So what happens in a post-war moment for somebody who's been through that much trauma? And so I kind of want to write an article about called like Ingrid Berg is being oh I had all this list like being burned beaten strangled poisoned like because all the movies post Casablanca they torture the hell out of her and I feel like it's because she didn't go to the war obviously but she through Casablanca the central war movie she represented like you know women's strength like like the whole you know everybody's giving stuff up for her but she's very strong but then she has to in Casablanca she has the moment like I just want you to do all the thinking for me even though she's been doing all the thinking all along it's really so I feel like there's something that brought up this like kind of fear of a woman having that much control over global oh. politics do you know what I mean yeah you know I think most I mean if you look at the careers of most film actresses they have, they have you know when they make it big they are then put every from Linda Blair on they're all put in these humiliating positions they're, yeah. they're they're raped they're torched yeah i mean you know it, it, it's yeah. once they've had their breakout film yeah we're much stronger um more yeah. more more role challenging part yeah. you know gender role challenging part then they get humiliated and 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 for a decade after that and, you know they're all you know it's uh, it, it, this seemed to be kind of setting that yeah, no, it's a very common thing. I do think in Ingrid Bergen's case, it's so extreme too, because as you know, like only like what, this is six years later is when she's totally kicked out of Hollywood, like chastised because she has a baby out of wedlock with Roberto Rossellini. And so like, she's this scandalous. So her Hollywood career, 
only last few more years she has her comeback later of course she has a career in Italy and so she makes films elsewhere but there's this sense that Hollywood punishes her she, they're like you had too much success we're gonna make these movies that really keep just I mean just the, the gaslight itself she starts out and I do love the fact that we get the backstory for this reason because you see strong confident singing Ingrid Bergman and you watch the slow process of making a, you know a, a, a character and an actress that strong being you know just it's so devastating and I mean it, it's like some people don't want to see that but I'm like that's how powerful gaslighting is that it can take down even you know the Ingrid Bergmans of the world right but the fact that we they so want to do that to her character I think is definitely a sign of what you're talking about just Hollywood yeah, it's Hollywood punishing it's successful women yeah exactly yeah like Mar look at Margot Robbie's career for example I mean yeah. anyway, anyway but the point yeah. No, I think that's totally right. And that's totally part of the context that we should thinking, be thinking about. And I will point out in of Cast of Life of the year before, but also Shadow of a Doubt from the year before, where Joseph Cotton is the he's the bad guy. At, but it's it's so I think Shadow of a Doubt has a lot to do with gaslighting. And I feel like this was I feel like Hitchcock was like, why the hell didn't I make gaslight? That's so my kind of movie. But it's very thinking about the relationship between Joseph Cotton, that that's what audiences would have just seen him in. And now we're going to recap. So I just we are right the interplay with the actors and what they've just come from is really important to bear in mind because audiences then that's how they would have viewed them is through the lens of what they just saw them in yeah all right and jay morrow you're raising your hand again um so i was first off thank you for bringing up shadow of a doubt that was a recent discovery of mine and it's now probably my favorite hitchcock if you haven't seen it it's worth going out and finding yeah. but i was thinking with this brutality toward Ingrid Bergman and her films if this feeds into kind of the Saint Ingrid marketing that was going in because you mm -hmm. basically celebrities had these brands and I was also thinking about her in contrast to admittedly a Warner Brothers actress so not MGM um Betty Davis where you don't have the same torture of Betty Davis because she's Betty Davis and I'm wondering how studio branding kind of shapes into mm -hmm. the type of narrative that these actresses are placed in. Yes. I feel like I don't want to put you on the spot, Julia Stern. If I don't know if you're, because I can't see your thing, but Julia Stern, who's on this call, is like, the expert on Betty Davis. She has a book that just recently came out called Betty Davis Black and White, which you should totally read. But um, I, I'm interested if she wanted to weigh in on this, but she might possibly have stepped away. So whatever, but I can talk about it too. So um, yes, I think it's for sure the idea of each actress, they, you know, the Hollywood publicity machine wanted to create a story that you were one kind of person. And so Ingrid Bergman, like the way she was introduced to American audiences was that she was this pure golden child kind of, but then she made a lot of movies that were much more complicated. And Hitchcock's Notorious is, is fabulous for giving her a very different kind of role that she absolutely wanted. Oh, Julia Stern is saying my audio and video don't work, but she would have brilliant things to say about the Billy Davis part of this, but um, certainly um, that we want to, uh, they knew how audiences, they wanted to kind of create a, a narrative about the kind of actor they were. And then they would very much, and act, a lot of actors were really trying to fight against that. Like, don't pigeonhole me. Don't try to say I'm just kind of one kind of actor. And so um, I think Ingrid Bergman wanted to fight against that. But in the movie, something like Notorious, where she plays like, She's the notorious one. She's an alcoholic. She sleeps around all this stuff. But boy, does it punish her for it, right? So it's just like the we. If you're playing against your angelic type, I mean, even Casablanca, it's not. She's she's very um, idealized in some ways, but it's also the plot is like you. He thinks she cheated on him, you know, and then she gets vindicated. I don't want to give away too much, but so yeah, I think that Ingrid Bergman has a very different um, audience perspective than Petty Davis, and so you're gonna there's something about her that I think people wanted. She seemed too strong and in a way that felt like they could take it out on her. I don't know. I just think that there's just, I mean, under Capricorn, which I referenced, it was not successful, but it's kind of painful to watch what they do, what they do to her without um, kind of, Oh, think about her in Spellbound, uh, Julia just put in the, in my chat. And that's true. Another Hitchcock film where they have, where she's the psychologist and she's, and you know, she starts off and she's very strong and she's like, I'm going to push away 
men and I'm going to be this intelligent woman and, and all these men are hitting on her. But then she gives it all. She falls in love with. So I don't again, I don't, don't want to give away plots, but it's very much like we have to tear her down, make make her more about romance, make her more about love. Even the smart intel. Take those glasses off. How many times do they have the, the woman, the actor who they started off with glasses and to show that they have a feminine side, we're going to make them take off their intelligence glasses and then fall in love. Right. And so that's the plot of a lot of Ingrid Bergman kind of things, too. So. I don't know. I'm a little bit rambling. What is this what you had in mind, or Jay, or did you want to say other things about the relationship between these different public personas? No, that's great. Thank you. Okay. I'm glad you just watched Shadow of a Doubt. That is a good one. And it was Hitchcock's favorite Hitchcock too. Um, yeah, Renee. Um, as long as we're as long as we're talking about about um women actors, I wonder if maybe we could talk a little bit about Angela Lansbury. Sure and that can. character in this film, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, she was she was astonishing and you know amazing and so so young and also like the like the ways in, the ways in which like um, <laughs> yes like the the like her her flirtations and the way in which she's she's mm -hmm. you know pitched as as rebellious but also as like you know kind of a whore and like mm -hmm. you know alert and but also like I just I I I would love to hear what people have to say about about yeah. that character about what she's doing here um I don't know how how much that character is or isn't in other versions of the film um yep. or uh, sorry other versions of the versions of the play slash film like and and what this particular movie does differently with her but also I mean I know that you know, it was like the beginning of Angela Lansbury, but like looking back from the duration of Angela Lansbury at that character is a really kind of um, unsettling and also kind of astonishing feeling. I wonder yeah. what, people, what people thought about that, about her, about about the presence of of both Angela Lansbury and that, that particular character. Mm -hmm. I want to hear what other people think too, but I'll, I'll answer your question about how close it is to the other versions because it, that character is in all the versions. Her name is Nancy and she's supposed to be really flirty and the lines are pretty darn similar in all of them. In the British film version, they actually kiss uh, she and the husband and they go out for a night on the town and they watch the can-can together. So you see the can-can interspersed with like rough coming and talking to Bella. So it's uh, kind of surreal. But the difference, I mean, I only know the actor in the movie version. I don't know exactly how she was playing the plays, but she's much more just like smiley, giggly, flirty. Oh, this would be so fun. So Angela Lansbury brings the like the, you know, the, the Angela Lansbury, just the like kind of saying it very flat and very, but like very, you know, manipulate. Like you do have a feeling that that she is part of the gaslighting process. There is the part where, where she says, oh, did you turn the, or can you do something for my husband? She said, you told me that already, ma'am. So she's participating in it because she is, you know, she wants to have a relationship with the husband. And that is in the original play. That's all there that um, she is flirtatious and, and their class comes into play for sure. Because it's definitely, I believe it marks it in the play that she has a Cockney accent. So I yeah. believe that it is definitely, I mean, obviously she's a servant, but also there's like the danger of having that kind of woman versus the kind of woman that Bella is. Yeah. But yeah, I would love for other people people to talk about Angela Lansbury in her very first role, which she was nominated for an Oscar for. So that's pretty impressive. And yeah. she was 18, I believe. Yeah, John. Unmute. Uh, do you, I see a little bit of class resistance in her mm -hmm. and agency, uh, mm -hmm. rather than seeing her as participating in the gaslighting, I see her as a kind of spunky working class woman who isn't content staying in the role of servant in comparison with Elizabeth, who's the dutiful Victorian uh, older uh, mm -hmm. female stereotype. So so I, I really liked, I think she steals every scene that she's in. She does. Um, so that's my comment. Yeah. I agree with that. I don't think those are necessarily mutually exclusive, like that she wants all those things and you kind of understand why she should and that there are, you know, you feel the, the class prejudices, but at the same time, part of her strategy for doing that is to, if I see that the husband is manipulating the wife, I'll still play, I'll, I'll, I want to be on the side of the husband because I can manipulate my sexuality in ways that I'm totally fine with and I have no problem with, but that I do think that she 
kind of gets what's going on and is okay to play into that to some extent. Whereas Elizabeth, I think, is very oblivious to what's going on. And then you do have that sense of a little bit of female sol solidarity at the end there where she's like, I'm going to, I, I now get it. And so now I'm going to be on your side. But I think you're, you can be that you get that Nancy is totally like there are, she's fighting for what she deserves and she's a smart, intelligent woman. But part of how she does that is by, you know, not being particularly generous to another woman. So like, that's that's the reality of her situation. It doesn't mean that it's not um, okay. Yeah, and I see oh, Ava raising her hand. Oh yeah, I was just gonna reiterate that like that kind of like, even though she's being mean to another woman in this context, right? It's It's her trying to liberate herself from mm -hmm. a socioeconomic position mm -hmm. um, and also like it's yeah agency is a woman even though it's like it's sub oppressing I guess in the in the go with the goal of independence absolutely absolutely and just in terms of the way they deal with sex with her and the fact that they're like oh she's clearly flirting with police officers and doing this and she but she has the line like I can take care and he's like oh you know you might get in trouble Nancy and she's like oh no, no, no. I know what I'm doing I'm doing this for my own and so there's a really kind of you know, kind of anti-slut shaming to that part because it's just saying this is a, a smart, intelligent young woman. It also is pointing out the Victorian culture only lets women get ahead, uh, you know, through sexual manipulations. And like, she doesn't have a lot of options besides that because she is a working class woman, right? So it's like kind of, you could read it as critiquing the Victorian culture that puts her in that position. But you also, the way, especially the way that Angela Lansbury plays her, you have a lot of respect for that because she's makes it, you know, she's an enjoyable she steals the scenes as John, but like she's the one you want to watch. And so therefore it gives her that inherently gives her um, kind of more, more empathy or not empathy, but you know, that we, we like her because she's so awesome. Yeah. Anybody else want to comment on her? Um, oh, I, I see in the chat too. And what about Dame May Whitney, that Whitney, the, uh, the next door neighbor looking like Queen Victoria. Yeah. So she's a, a fabulous um, character actress who, um, you know, started so, so late. I love stories of actors who don't like start making movies till they're like 70. I'm like, oh good, I still have a chance of being there. No, uh, <laughs> but she's fabulous and I, I'm gonna keep making Hitchcock references. She's also in this movie called The Lady Vanishes. That's a, a British Hitchcock film from 1938 maybe. And that's such a gaslighting plot because the plot is, the, I'll just say that this, this woman gets on a train, she meets uh, Dame Minnie her character and she's like talking with her and then she falls asleep and she wakes up and everyone's like, what are you talking about? There was no lady there, you're crazy. And so that's the, van and so you'll, I won't tell you how it plays out, but it's very much a precursor to the gaslighting plot as well. So there's just all these interconnections and I do love her, her um, wells in this one, yeah. Um, does anybody else want to comment on any of the characters or this was my question that I was gonna ask that people have already started doing this, but I can raise it more broadly um, for anybody else to wanna uh, make similar comments. So. I'm an English professor and I mainly teach literature focused classes, but classes, but I also teach film focus focused classes to um, English majors a lot. And in those classes, I'm always trying to get my students to think more about the many different cinematic elements that are contributing to our sense of the story and its thematic implications. And so some people have already started doing this. I thought I would encourage all of you to try to think about how your sense of what's going on in the film and how you feel about the characters and so on is being affected by things like, I'm gonna give you a long list, like lighting, obviously high lighting in a movie called Gaslight. This is hugely important um, to our sense of things in various moments. Camera angles, which were mentioned to the idea of thinking, are we looking up? Or are we looking down? Are we at the same length? And then uh, shot configuration, is it a close up, medium shot, far away, thinking about how that changes the power dynamics, the editing and pacing. So are we spending a long time on one shot? Are we going back and forth and back and forth and how that really gives you a different sense of the of the motion of the film and sound, both diegetic and extra diegetic. So the diegetic sounds are the ones that we hear, like when he's playing the piano for her and she's singing, that's all happening within it. But then the difference between the movie soundtrack that comes on and absolutely shapes our, our feelings at every given moment. And when is there silence in the background? When are there voiceovers? There's one um, interesting use of voiceover in this film. 
Um, and then costuming is hugely important, especially when you're doing a period piece. Um, and so thinking about like, for example, the weight of Ingrid Bergman's dresses in some cases and how and the color schemes of them and how they change over the course of the film. And set design, that's enormous because this is so much set in one place for the most part and how just think about all the tchotchkes, how much stuff there is all around and just like, and look, paying attention if you want to. Sometimes you look at something like, wow, that's a very weird picture they have in the background there. Um, and the acting styles of the different uh, characters as we've started to hit on too. So all those kinds of things, I just open that up for people to comment on things. And if you want, I technically could show some scenes. If you want to call our attention to a certain scene, you could. I could try to play it. I have my DVD up on this computer. It might be more trouble than it's worth, but we can see. So Michael, I see you raising your hand. Oh, um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm one step behind you. And I was going to comment on a character but there's a lot to talk about in terms of cinematography but, you know i thought that interesting about joseph cotton's character is again the class thing you know he's very comfortable at the soiree the musical soiree he's wearing white tie i mean you can contrast him to a victorian detective like bucket say so, you know mm -hmm. where the class delta in so, is so markedly part of the whole dynamic of that um you know the fact that he he, he is clearly upper upper class and that mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense um, mm -hmm. You know, again, why? And that he he presents her with the other glove. That's right out of Scott. It's Sir Galahad, right? I mm -hmm. mean, and, and, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and that just yeah. seemed incongruous. And you know, the whole the class structure in that film is really muddled. And I think that's one of the most, that's one of the most interesting things about it. But, but the, you know, the power, the, the way the camera enacts power relations. That's the classic signature of film noir. And yeah. it's it's it, Cooker gets it all. I mean, he. He, you know, he didn't do noir, but he 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 gets it all right, and he it's just right. perfect, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so. I agree. I, I'll, I will say something you'll find interesting in terms of the history of that, because I've read all the different um, drafts of the screenplay. And up until they cast Joseph Cotton, they had changed the character into a love interest for sure. But his name was Sir Roger. He was supposed to be like just like a, a, kind of like in. Um, Oh, what's the Hitchcock movie where uh, it's Herbert Marshall uh, murder, where he's like a gentleman who's he, he, he like, I'm just going to do this for fun. I'm going to try to solve a case for fun. This is it. So he's really supposed to be high class. And he is, um, they make in that version that we find out that really the mother uh, uh, was the opera singer was um, Paula's mother and she had her out of wedlock, right? So that's why they had to pretend it was her niece, right? And he was in love. I think he had a relationship with the mother. And so then she says things like, I don't think I could be with you because it's too creepy because you were really in love with my mother. And now you just want me instead. And he's like, no, it's fine. Don't worry about it. I love you now. So there's, but it's definitely this like high class. So it, it, when they change it to, to, to Joseph Cotton, they had to scramble to be like, okay, we still want it to be, but we won't make it that he was in love. We'll make it that he was a little kid because he's young, because he was probably supposed to be older in that version. You see what I mean? So they're like, you're right. It feels muddled because they were just kind of like, oh, now we've got this actor. We'll change the plot certain ways, but we won't bother to follow through. So I think that's why you get that impression with that. Um, and yeah, with the, the cinematography, it's definitely playing with all the shadows and lights and the and using like the banisters of the staircase to catch. So there's ways that it, the way that film noir does that it's like using that kind of expressionism playing off of a lot of German expressionism and it's camera angle and uh, camera lighting. Yeah. Um, John. The, the least probable uh, part of the film and you've mm -hmm. helped to explain a little bit uh, how it was handled previously is that the detective, this junior detective at Scotland Guard Yard gets an invitation to the aristocratic soiree. Right, exactly. And so exactly. they manufacture a family relationship and a, a, a romance right. set up matchmaking plot that never goes anywhere because yeah. it, it has to come back at the end. Yeah. Uh, but th that, that, that seemed, and, and Michael's uh, comment about his clothing too that he, mm -hmm. he he's, he's out of place he's he doesn't belong at that uh, right. at that soiree um yeah. but uh just to 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 add one other thing about the cinematography uh and a, a question on a slightly different point to um fog i mean this, this this is you know straight straight out of bleak house chapter 2 or sherlock holmes this is you know the 
one of the quintessential London fog uh, films. And that's part of the film noir. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and my, my question, my irrelevant question, which is, I guess it's about tchotchkes, is about the glove. Um, mm -hmm. And is the glove in all of the earlier versions? Uh, no, version of that. What, yeah. the, the, when when I saw the glove, I I thought rosebud. Um, mm -hmm. this, yeah, yeah. This, this citizen Kane. Right. Uh, but uh, do you have any thoughts about the the glove as a device? Yeah, it feels to me also just very Cinderella. I've got the matching glove. That means I'm your your prince charming kind of thing. But I it was definitely just added in the version where they wanted to make uh, him a love interest. So in any other all the other versions, he's this older detective who was on the case 20 years ago. And this one, it's just 10 years because they want to make them closer in age. But they he's this um he was on the case 20 years ago. He didn't. There's no opera singer. There's no one. He didn't know Alice Barlow. There's no connections personally between the detective and the murder victim whatsoever. So um, that's just all manufactured for, we wanna have it that this detective has like a personal stake in it, not just that he, cause they didn't, I guess maybe the difference is, is that he's so young that they didn't wanna make it that he was on the case then because they implied that that would be used like a teenager, you know, you wouldn't have been on the case. So they have to come up with how he cared about the, the uh, murder victim instead. But again, there was that whole version of it where he actually had a relationship with the aunt or the mother, right? So that was, yeah, so it's it's all that's all the Hollywood version. They're just adding um, stuff that I do think was probably you know we've got Joseph Cotton. Let's make it feel a little Citizen Kane too. Like let's bring in all the connections for our moviegoers to other plots that they they will think of with these actors. Yeah. Um, does anybody else want to say anything about that? I was going to ask this question that I want to make sure we have time for about since my, my book is about Victorian gaslighting and and I talked last week about ways that you can connect. Uh, the gaslighting plot, back, gaslighting plot back to Victorian literature. Um, would anybody like to think about ways that they, now that they know the gaslight plot, that they can see how it did, how there are Victorian novels, Dickens novels, other novels, or poems, or short stories, or whatever you want to talk about, where you feel kind of proto gaslighting happening? And I see Glenna raising your hand. Pardon me, I'm a couple of beats behind because well, I'm having fun with fine. my yeah, phone, but. Um, have we talked about the third man at all? No, we haven't talked about the third man. Because it's it of the same era. Doesn't mm -hmm. it start uh, Joseph Cotton? Mm -hmm. And again, we're only mm -hmm. gradually led uh -huh. into elements of the plot. So uh -huh. it just yep. occurred to me that that was a relevant um, For sure. point of discussion. Yeah, no, absolutely. I feel like there's just this gaslight. If you just start to kind of feel the web that it's like when thinking about it in relation to how movies both before and after it, how they're bouncing off each other because it becomes once it's really successful like this, like Gaslight, the 1944 version, it becomes that it's, it's you know, a kind of common idea that people can they know that moviegoers, many of them would be familiar with it, so they can kind of riff off of it and have similar themes. And I think that's really important. So yeah, thank you for that. And and now I see Blair too, and then Michael again. Okay. Um, uh, I've only been with this group for uh, less than two years. I don't know what's been discussed in the past, mm -hmm. uh, but perhaps in the past we've discussed the uh, in fact, that in the uh, 2005 revival, uh, BBC revival of Doctor Who, episode yeah. number two, Simon Callow plays Charles Dickens, and he and Doctor Who thwart <laughs> an alien invasion that comes to uh, Victorian Cardiff uh, through their gaslights. Ah, okay. Excellent. And um, huh? anyway, that's that's uh, yeah. there has to be a connection somewhere that I think this. I bet I there is. Mention it. I don't know if we've discussed that before in this group. I don't think we have, but I personally don't. I haven't seen that Doctor Who, so I can't comment. But if anybody else has and would like to, to um. To weigh in on that but that sounds perfect that absolutely does that sounds totally relevant and like they were definitely kind of commenting on the real connection between um dickens and gaslight and all these things michael yeah did you want to comment on that oh, or uh, yeah well i mean we're doing great expectations this year 
right? A Dickens can. I mean, Pip is gaslighted, I, right? I mean, you know, I mean, where does, you know, you led me on, he says to Miss Havishan, you let me go on. I mean, yeah. thinking all along that it was you. Um, it, it, it's that's you know one of the heartbreaking scenes in the in the book, uh, but I, I, it seems fundamental to the whole notion of where does money come from? And uh, Esther is gaslighted in Bleak House in some ways. I mean, her aunt in her origin story, and you know where does she come from? You know what does her name mean? I mean all, all of the there, there there are many deceived. I mean, think of our mutual friend. I mean, there are many Dickens plots, you know, turn on the notion of, or just, you know, of deception and of misle mis misleading people um, about who you are and what you're up to. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say, I don't feel this way. Some scholars of gaslighting are like, well, we have to be really careful about overusing the term and it shouldn't just be when it's deception and it could be. And I'm like, but it, but that's how people use it. And I do think that what you're just all the plots you're describing are where they're like fundamentally making people's sense of reality like they're, they're telling them one thing is true, their whole sense of self and they're pulling the rug out from under that. And that is what happens in this her sense of reality, like her sense of that she can remember where she puts things, but it's still, it's the same kind of feeling that you don't know who you are anymore. And also I'll point out that in the Gaslight plot, the way it winds up, it's very much, he he, he uses the, your mother was mad. And so it's like, you're, if I tell you your identity is this, then you're gonna believe it. And then at the end he says, no, that wasn't true, but it's the same, like using the inheritance and who you, where you come from, that that gives you a sense of where you belong in the world. And when that's when that's false and, um, and also when it's done for, you know, nefarious manipulative reasons and that gaslighting, right? Yeah. So I think you're right. And then there's a comic version, you know, Buffin, you know, Buffin's pretending, Buffin's pretending to be a miser is a comic version of that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's a comic, there's a comic version in Dickens always of, mm -hmm. of pretending to be something you're not as well. And there's going to be that. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know. And you have to always think, what is the goal too? Like I said, that they're doing it to, I think it becomes gaslighting when you're really trying to um, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, bad. find somebody else's. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, I, I think I mentioned in the last talk the idea of um, in Little Dorrit with uh, the Flint Lynches, right? And that he is very much like telling her, you're dreaming, this isn't real, because he, ha he has all these, you know, uh, criminal plots afoot and he doesn't want her to realize what's going on. And so that, that to me, that absolutely feels like gaslighting as well. Yeah. Anybody else want to comment on ones they can think of? It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be Victorian. Even if you want to talk about something that's more recent or or from before that, we can also just think about other times where that feels like um, a, a useful term in terms of thinking about a, a fictional text. Yes, uh, Margaret. Okay, I, I'd like to talk for you to talk about how gaslight was a great improvement and that it was a good thing. Gaslight was a good thing and it was a, 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 a wonderful modernization of how people lived. Uh -huh. And uh, also the, uh, the sense, the, uh, let's talk about the Victorian marriage mm -hmm. where the, uh, the dynamic between the man and the woman was that the man would protect. And I think that even in some of the marriage vows or the marriage ceremonies, that was included that the male would protect and be the strong one and that the woman would need this protection and mm -hmm. which which would be true in, according to the society i mean whether she had money or not that she mm -hmm. would need protection to navigate life right. so those two, th those two things as gaslight as a good thing and mm -hmm. and the uh, the marital relationship the power the power the strength as, as a good thing also. So uh, that's about all I, I, I'd like yeah, you to. No, those are, those are great you. points. Yeah, and Thank let you. me start with the marriage thing. And I will point out that I feel bad wanting to quote the movie I didn't have you guys watch, but I think it's so fascinating because of course the plot is that he is telling her, I know what's best for you. I am protecting you. Like, so he's using the language, what you're saying, like 
And then he's he's doing the dark side of that because in fact he's creating the illness instead of protecting her from it, right? And so in the in the British film version, there's this scene where she has this English cousin from Devonshire who comes to um, visit, and they and it's just the two men, Scranton, the husband and the cousin, and they're they're disagreeing on who is protect who can protect her better, right? And so the husband said, "It's my job. I know what's best for my wife. What's best for my wife and her health is for her to stay indoors all the time and never see." And the and the cousin is saying no she should come to devonshire and be out in the light and the the open air and then she, and drink have devonshire cream and then her cheeks will come back so they're debating but they're both men saying i know it's right no i would know it's right but there is the sense that that was supposed to be the the husbandly duty and the the gaslight plot like it kind of pulls the rug out for her that it says if a man is a jerk and, and 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 criminal and a psychopath. I mean, he really is all those things. He can use that assumption that what he's doing is for the so like the servants have to just agree to let him say no, she's not well enough for visitors because that is the Victorian you know expectation. And when he if he chooses to manipulate that and use it for his own purposes, which is to drive her insane so that he can now have the ownership of the house and look for the jewels whenever he wants. He can do that because the culture and the laws allow him to do that. And that the and that both of the female servants, Nancy, who might want something out of him, but Elizabeth, who doesn't, they so easily buy into that narrative that he's just doing it for her own good because that's what Victorian culture tells them is supposed to be happening, right? And so, but I do think the plot shows us that you know, if a man wants to, he can totally turn that on its head and cause harm through his ability to have total ownership over this woman, right? And then in terms of the gaslight, yes, absolutely. The idea that that's part of what I was getting at too is gaslight is a, a term of illumination and like being able to see more because now we have lights in the house and we're not, and it's not just candles that were more dangerous. They could be knocked over. But also I did want to point out that we have a chapter of this book that's fascinating. I didn't know any of this history before I read this chapter, but it's about that the gaslight industry that started in like the 18. 20s big gas as we would call it now they very much at the beginning they were trying so hard to tell convince all these consumers that they were crazy for thinking there was anything dangerous about having gas gas pipelines put through their houses because, but there were in fact especially at the beginning all kinds of explosions dangerous things too much gas was getting in and people would have all kinds of you know they weren't regulated like there is today so there were people dying of Inhaling, inhaling too much stuff and the, the actual like pamphlets they seem like they're gaslighting because they're just like oh these overly paranoid women who think that they're going to get harmed by our wonderful gas and they're like so and so you're right that the fact that we needed to get to the place where people could see and like illumination of the house and it became ultimately safer but I will point out that you all remember a couple of years I mean a year ago when there was the big the gas, uh, they were saying the gas stoves are in fact much more dangerous for us than electric stoves. They're like, really, everyone should be switching to electric for their own health of their breathing and so forth. And the gas industry was really quick to say, oh, but women, don't you love cooking on your gas burner? It makes food taste better. And it's not that dangerous. It's like, there, so there's still this sense that the gas industry does not want you to acknowledge some of the actual kind of environmental hazards of it. But at the same time, convenience, is convenience and people want their, you know, so anyway, but I do think that that's related to the question of what's good for you and what's not. It's kind of environmentally, it's very tricky. And obviously we know that um, gas has done some bad things <laughs> over the course of the past couple centuries, right? But yeah, no, those are all great points. And I think that these, I think that this text is making us think about those things. Like the gaslight is not just what he does to trick her, as I point out, it's what she, how she's able to understand what he's doing because she's so good at watching the gaslights going up and down and she's able to figure it out. So we can't lose that part of the positiveness of what she's able to get from paying attention to the light. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, would anybody else like to think about any of those things? Let me see. I also have other questions if nobody else is. Oh, I do see it. Uh, Courtney, yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering if you can talk about Dickens and his mm -hmm. gaslighting of his wife. I can. Now, I saw, I think she's gone. Catherine Kim was on this call for a little bit, and she wrote the chapter for our collection that's called Charles Dickens as Gaslighter, A Tale of Two Catherines. And what this chapter does is it's 
first, the first half of it is talking about Catherine Dickens, his wife, and this I can tell you that's right. But what Catherine Kim, the author, another thing she she writes about another a uh, woman named Catherine Crow, who was an, a writer from the same time, who for a while Dickens really championed her and published her and thought she was great. And then she kind of had a, a, a medical episode that was kind of hard to know. What, she was allegedly seen like, had like kind of a nervous breakdown and was walking through the streets naked and, and all this stuff. But then we now think that that was probably not that true of a story, but Dickens really kind of amplified it and made fun of her, and and he kind of ruined her career because he kind of was like we. And she was she was a big believer in um, was it uh, spiritualism or mesmerism or something? I, I can't remember. I read this chapter in a while, but anyway, so so that's the tale of two Catherines. Is that it's that Catherine and Catherine Dickens, and the the story of that is that um, John Bowen, one of our Dickens Universe uh, folks, a couple years ago, maybe a few, maybe twenty nineteen, I think, he found a new. Um, piece of archival evidence that that was about the fact that Dickens had tried to have Catherine um, committed to an insane asylum and that the doc, what the evidence is, is about the doctor saying no like no she's not mentally ill she doesn't belong here we had had evidence of this like um, so I think it was an aunt or someone had said something of, of Catherine's had said this long ago but there was a lot of kind of speculation so what our chapter does is kind of walks through the history of critics either believing or not believing this narrative, right? But um, even besides that, we were also thinking about the way that he um, did things that would be very, were very kind of psychologically manipulative, like the story about how he had, um, after the separation that he had, the, the kids go to piano lessons, I think it was, across the street from Catherine Dickens's new house so that they would, she would see them going in, but she wasn't allowed to say anything to them. So things like that, that are gaslighting, but they're just still psychological manipulation that are related to it. And so, yeah, unfortunately we, and what the chapter kind of points out is like, here's this author who wrote some novels that have amazing examples of gaslighting of men gaslighting women and other genders going on, but that it really seems sympathetic towards the gaslit victim. And he really could understand that and like tell a story that makes you feel that the kind of horribleness of that narrative. But then in his own life, he seems to have, and of course, right, right before Dickens and, and Catherine uh, Dickens got separated, there was the whole story with Edward Bulwer Lytton and Rosina and his wife, who he did have institutionalized because she had spoken out against him. So a lot of people, that was what, so people relate that. And it was kind of uh, a big, there were, there were real life examples of where this happened. And of course, uh, Dick, Wilkie Collins' is Woman in White, we talked about, I talked about a little bit last time, and that relates to that narrative of, of women getting wrongfully uh, consigned in insane asylums. It happened to men too, for sure, but some of the most famous examples um, were of women. So does that answer your question about Catherine enough? Sorry, it's not pleasant for Dickensians to think about that, but it is a part of um, the history that we're that we're learning more and more about. I think as as people keep digging through the archives and have different perspectives about it. Yeah. Anybody else want to ask a question? Or okay, let me see if I have any other questions that I wanted to ask you. Um, oh yeah, I was going to ask you about melodrama because, um, of course, people use that term today often very pejoratively to say something is like bad, over the top, excessive drama. But as you might have heard in, in various talks over the years at Dickens Universe, melodrama is a specific genre um, that was hugely popular in the Victorian era, and Dickens absolutely was um, was uh, deploying it in many of his works, but the, the kind of theatrical melodramas. And I personally think that this is one of the best Hollywood melodramas of all time. I think that that word is really um, appropriate for what's going on in this. And so I wanted to ask you how the melodramatic impulses of this film or some of the specific actors within it and their acting style struck you. Did you find it to be melodramatic in a good way, a bad way, an unexpected way, a frustrating way? So. That's what I was wanted to hear about because I think some people I think some people get put off by the melodrama in this film and some people really like to embrace it and so let me hear your thoughts. Okay, Glenna. Yeah, I I that's one of the things I really appreciated about this movie. I watched it because I'd never watched it before and I, you know, wanted to do my homework. And I was enthralled by it. And I kept thinking, this is really melodramatic, but mm -hmm. I love it. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought Ingrid Bergman's performance was so bravura. And of course, she's 
over the top in some instances, but I I love the narrative arc that her performance establishes where she's this young woman who has had this traumatic episode and she's so hungry to be loved that she falls for this guy that she's only met for two weeks and to see the tenderness and starting there and it's a melodramatic arc, but it, mm -hmm. I thought it was so compelling. And then at the end where she's trying to psychologically torture him the way he's tortured her. I mean, there's nothing naturalistic about any of this, right? but right. it's wonderful. Yeah. I'm on the same page with you. Obviously, that's how I feel. And I do think that I feel like if you're going to tell this story, I think that when people watch it and they're like, okay, this is what the term gaslighting means. But if it weren't that heightened, and I will say the British film version, that's kind of why I don't like it as much. Some people like it better, but the, the main actress's uh, performance is so much more um, quiet and like just it. And like, that's a way to choose to do it too. But it feels like it's trying to be, I don't know if it's quite naturalistic, but it's trying to be more um, subdued and not over the top. But I feel like I feel so much more for the Ingrid Bergman version of this because it, it is like when, if somebody is making you feel crazy, that's like one of the most horrifyingly intense feelings that you can feel. And if you're not, and I think most audiences want to go all the way in and really feel it with them. And so I do think that there's just, if you, um, but even even the way of Charles Boyer, the, the actor who plays Gregory is so melodramatic as a villain. He's so, you know, hyperbolic as a villain, but like he reminds me of kind of a 19th century villain. I can imagine him twirling mustache, but I feel like you, you need that to show how horrific it is. It really pays off to have um, this performance that it just digs into, and then thinking about like camera angles, that moment where it comes close on his face and he's just staring at you. It's just like, you feel your, your guts like feeling it. And I think that it, it just is about the affect. You need to have that level to make it feel as horrific as we all know the feeling of being gaslit would be, right? So I agree with you. I think she, and I think it is just unbelievable in this. Yes, and John. Yes, just to reiterate what Glenna said and what you have reinforced, I, I, I think the acting style is clearly based in melodrama. And what I like about it is the way in which it modulates between a more naturalistic kind of self-representation and those moments of excess. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, that when, when Gregory gets really yeah. angry, it's mm -hmm. it's scary because he's right. been smooth and calm and kind of reserved, always in a creepy way, but never with that explosiveness that yeah. uh, he exhibits at certain moments. And similarly with uh, with uh, uh, Ingrid Bergman, that uh, she goes into moments of hysteria, mm -hmm. and and that hysteria, I mean, you know, and we we think Freud and we think uh, you know studies in in hysteria. Mm -hmm. there, there's an excess where the body takes over and the 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 mind is no longer in control and uh and being gaslit does produce that effect in in her and i think behind that is uh both the um both both the stage melodrama of the victorian age and and opera because lucia de lamamour is is yeah. the uh, you, you know, yeah. is invoked at the outset of the, and, and that has famous mad scenes. Uh, yeah. in it. So uh, this this is it's a it's a it's a very literary film, I think. Mm -hmm. Literary, both in the sort of contextual way in which you uh, ha have already pointed out, but also in some of its internal references and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so, uh, you know. And, and popular culture as well. I mean, Nancy wants to go to the music hall and the music hall is uh, uh, one of the sites where where melodrama is occasionally right, performed. Right. So, so yeah. there, there, you know, melodrama is quintessentially a popular uh, yeah. part. And, yeah. and uh, uh, so, you know, the film is the popular culture of our time too. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And I will just mention one other um, literary reference that I, I, did I say this last time? I can't remember. I finally figured it out after years of watching this movie, the, the scene where she's reading a book and you have the voiceover of him saying, your mother is mad, your mother is mad. And she's reading out loud a, a book and she's trying to focus on the book. And I could never understand what she was saying. I finally figured it out. 
it's a it's a chapter from Villette by Charlotte Bronte and it's specifically the scene where she's like some people get to go out to the theater all the time and it's no big deal but for me this is such a big deal to have to get to leave the house and go to the theater or get to leave or to, so anyway it's a it is a Victorian reference and it's specifically related to the things you're talking about but um I do think that I will say that we have a chapter of my book I keep making it about, about this book but that's what's on my mind right now that is about the hysteria um, of the 19th century treatments of hysteria, starting with like French, like Charcot in France and Paris and so forth, but going towards Freud too. And the idea of, of how often they were, the question of whether they were manipulating any of their patients into thinking, call, labeling it hysteria versus whatever. And so the idea of how gaslighting and the history of mental illness, it's related to both over-diagnosing mental illness and under-diagnosing mental illness, right? So it's about not acknowledging when somebody really has something going on and writing it off as, you know, you're just, uh, like if they have some medical reason for something and writing it off of you're just crazy. But there's also, uh, of course, gaslighting in this version and in, in the, the, the movie and the plays is him telling her that there's something wrong with her mind and then her believing it. And so how often could the people were very actually worried about this in the 19th century with like, hip, that's what my chapter is about with hypnotism and mesmerism. Could you talk someone into being um, either sick or crazy? Could you, could the doctor or the hypnotist or the mesmerist, could they, did they have this power to control your, and make you into somebody who's hysterical or make you into, so it's like, you know, I mean, certainly there is a line in the movie where Gregory says, Paul, you're being hysterical, stop. But of course he's the one who's made her hysterical. So it's not that he, um, is trying to help her in that it's that he's the cause but so how often can we just say the words you were hysterical and now that's how the world sees you right you have no recourse it's like you know you can't really if you deny it then you're just sounding more and more hysterical right so I think that this is all um, fascinating and really part of the gaslight plot is how it relates to um, to the 19th century because you know they make it explicit in the movie when he says I'm going to have to get two doctors to put you away and that we know is the actual historical um, Victorian way of, of, of having somebody consigned to the insane asylum. So it's certainly kind of grounding itself in reality of the 19th century. Yeah. All right. Would anybody else like to, uh, <laughs> oh, you, John, go ahead. I, I, I have, I have one other uh, part of the film that I, I wanted to ask yeah. about and, and speculate about a little bit. And it's the, it's the final scene when, uh, when Gregory is, bound in the chair and uh, uh, she comes in alone and they have the, the final face off between them and there's a there's a close up with her face very very close to his and he's using his mesmeric or quasi mesmeric uh, power to exert his influence over her to cut the ropes and and uh, he instructs her about where to find the knife and 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 she has the the knife and you know for a minute there you don't know whether she's going to cut the ropes uh, under his influence or whether she's going to kill him and mm -hmm. that that's the moment of uh, Victorian melodramatic female mm -hmm. agency and mm -hmm. I, I I I you know I thought about how how many how, how many other novels or plays or anything from the nineteenth century show a woman carrying a, a knife, a woman holding a knife. And I can think of one of the illustrations in Dombey and Son. I can think of Becky Sharp in Vanity Fair. I can think even of little Emily in David Copperfield when uh, Steerforth abandons her and turns her over to his body servant, uh, Littimer and she resists him with a knife. And so the woman with a knife, uh, phallic, uh, whatever, female agency, revenge, female power in, in, in its most pointed version. Uh, anyway, uh, any other thoughts about that scene that you would like to? Yeah. No, that's all great. And it makes me think also, Jack, that back to like Greek tragedies, right, of women with knives and getting and murdering for revenge. And there's just real sense of, uh, with Dami and Son, it made me think of that great scene where Edith 
where Carker thinks that he's been the one to commit to, and she's like, ha ha, I'm flipping the script. And in fact, I'm not running off with you. I'm just using, and so that feels like the, I'm using your form of manipulation and turning the tables on you so that now you're the victim of the thing that you thought that you were the, the um, and that's really what that scene is at the end. I will say the, the British film version does this even more. It has that she's holding the knife and she's like coming at him and it's even closer faces. I'm trying to act it out for you. And you see the, the literally the uh, the sweat beads on his forehead as he is. So it just makes it totally clear. You're like, is this a moment where she's about to kill him? Like this is, and so they tone it down a bit in the American version, but it's still, it's a knife and she's got the power. And he, I think in the, the play version, it's a razor, not a knife. So maybe they wanted to make it all the more phallic and make it the, the longer knife. But um, there's definitely the sense that this is, um, and that she doesn't choose to make it physical violence. She's like, I've got an even better one. I'll make it psychological violence. And I will use, I'll take the idea of madness that you wanted to put on me. And now I'm going to use it to say, I can't even figure out how to find your thing for you because I'm mad. And if I weren't, then I could actually help you. But I see um, Blair's hand up too. Yes, we were uh, looking for another example of a woman with a knife uh, set in that era, no, actually set around 1800, but written in that era is Tosca, mm. who kills the evil uh, bad guy uh, at the uh, end of the second act with a knife. Uh -huh. And as he's laying there dying on the floor, she puts candles on either side of him and a cross over his chest. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. uh, I don't know, you were looking for a cultural reference. Tosca is uh, very, very, still very, very popular among opera fans, including me. Yeah, I wonder if there is, I'm not, I don't know opera well enough to know if any of their, I'm always, there are other moments where you hear the, the music of things that I'm sure are, if I only knew the reference. So I wonder if Tosca is, is played at all in the movie. I don't, I didn't recognize any of it, but certainly feels like another um, intertext with it since it is an, an opera focused um, thing. So were you finished, um, Blair? Yeah. Okay. Yes. This, yes. Uh, I please. need to lower my hand. There we oh, go. Don't worry, don't worry. I just want to make sure I wasn't cutting you off. Um, and Michael, what were you going to say? Oh, uh, last thing. Woman with the biggest knife in 19th century literature that I can think of is Madame Defarge in the guillotine. Oh, well, that's a big <laughs> knife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was for you. That was for you, John. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like it. Um, yeah, I think that there is this sense of, you know, that, and it's so much about objects, right, in Gaslight. It's like that it's about jewelry and this and that. And so the idea that it becomes, can you take an object and instead of making it the thing that you've lost or that you are disempowered by, can you reclaim that power? And I do think that that's very much, in a way that would make the razor interesting too, because it's taking just a household, I mean, a knife is a household object too, but the idea of something that's more, is you can relate it to hygiene and domestic life. Um, that's interesting that it was the razor at first, but yeah. Um, does anybody else have anything else they wanted to, or other moments of the film that they wanted to bring up that we haven't, or anything else you wanted to ask me? before we go. Okay, well then I think maybe we are about at the end then. I don't wanna keep you longer than we need to be here, but thank you all so much for coming and talking about this movie. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I do, because <laughs> I do think it's a fabulous, fascinating movie, so. Huh. Thank you very much, Nora. This was wonderful. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad to have seen this film, which I oh, had okay, not good. seen that's, before. That's what I feel like most of the time when I get people to watch it, they go, oh, that was, that made me think about gaslighting in a new way. <laughs> yeah. So thank you all and have a great rest of your day.